The first person to receive an email from the whistle-blowing organization Football Leaks was Antonio Varela, a columnist at Record, one of Portugal's three national sports newspapers. The message arrived early in the afternoon of September 29, 2015. Varela, a precise, watchful man in his early fifties, clicked on a link which took him to a blog entry that had been created at 5.17 a.m. that day. Welcome to Football Leaks, it read in Portuguese. This project aims to show the hidden side of football. Unfortunately, the sport we love so much is rotten, and it is time to say enough. Below was a collection of previously unseen documents involving Sporting Lisbon, the eighteen-time winner of Portugal's National League. Contracts in Portuguese, contracts in English, contracts in French, Varela told me recently in Lisbon. I had no doubts about it. They were real documents. European soccer, which reaches its annual climax this weekend with the final of the Champions League, the game's most prestigious club competition, is a wonder of the sporting world. Storied teams such as Liverpool and Barcelona, Bayern Munich and Juventus rise and fall. Each year, the finest players and coaches conjure in new forms soccer's essential, unthinking grace. The business side of the sport, however, is more like a painting by Bruegel the Elder. Since 1955, the best teams from each country have played against one another, and that has given rise to a dense intermingling of tactics, feuds, and money. Money, above all. Money scores goals, as the German saying goes. Unlike American sports, with their draft picks, salary caps, and collective bargaining agreements, European soccer is a heedless Darwinian affair. Spending rules are broken, salaries are secrets, the best leagues are awash in Russian oligarchs, Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds, and Chinese conglomerates. Rumours fly, middlemen thrive. Between clubs, it's not only that we don't trust each other, a director at a top European club told me, we betray each other constantly. Last season, according to the accounting firm Deloitte, European soccer had revenues of $28 billion, about the same as Major League Baseball, the National Hockey League, and the National Football League combined. The first documents released by Football Leaks related to a controversial investment model known as third-party ownership. One of the ways that clubs make money is by buying and selling players. TPO, which originated in Latin America, allows external parties to buy a stake in promising young players, in the hope of profiting from a huge transfer deal one day. In 2017, the Brazilian striker Neymar was sold by Barcelona to Paris Saint-Germain for around a quarter of a billion dollars. Proponents of TPO describe it as a form of lending, but many fans believe that it gives investors too much control over a club's roster and the shape of players' careers by influencing when and where a player might be traded. In Portugal, one of the most vehement critics of TPO was Bruno de Cavallo, the president of Sporting Lisbon, who described it as a monster coming to football. FIFA, soccer's global governing body, banned the practice in May 2015. But the contracts that Varela read on football leaks showed that Sporting Lisbon had entered into a secret TPO-like arrangement with an Angolan club named Recreativo de Cala. It was powerful, Varela said. People say one thing, but they are doing something completely different. Varela's story filled two pages of record the following day. By the end of the week, Football Leaks had posted confidential contracts from FC Porto and Benfica, Portugal's biggest teams, Olympique Marseille, a leading French club, and FC Twente of the Netherlands. Fans learned that Georges Jesus, the coach of Sporting Lisbon, was earning five million euros a season, an extraordinary salary for the Portuguese league, while other files confirmed rumours and disclosed hidden investors. Together they gave a sense of seeing the business of soccer for the first time. Football Leaks was hosted by Live Journal, a Russian blogging service suggesting that it was the work of Russian hackers. But Varela was struck by the technical nature of the documents. He thought that a disaffected lawyer might be responsible. They were framing the problems with too much accuracy, Varela said. At the same time, he worried that the data might be stolen. In late November, 
after football leaks revealed that FC Twente had sold stakes in seven of its first team players to a single investment fund, its president resigned. The club was fined €180,000 and was banned from European competition for three years. In mid-December, a spokesperson for football leaks, calling himself John, agreed to answer questions emailed by the Times. People may think we are hackers. We are only regular computer users, John said. He claimed that the organization had been given 300 gigabytes of data by insiders, who were dismayed by soccer's excesses, and that it was receiving more all the time. The fight has been hard, John wrote, but we won't stop. The interview transfixed Raphael Buschmann, a 33-year-old sports reporter at Der Spiegel, the German news magazine who had covered organized crime and the financial side of soccer for ten years. I was totally electrified to get a hand on this data, he told me. For all John's bravado, it was clear that Football Leaks was having problems. The first blog was shut down by Live Journal. So was a second. There were days when the documents were hard to access, or infected by malware, which suddenly filled the screen with pornography. Mushman wrote to the site for weeks, but received no reply. On January 3, 2016, the group finally responded. What is your problem with football? Kind regards, FL. That evening, confidential contracts related to the image rights of Cristiano Ronaldo, at that time the star forward for Real Madrid, appeared on the blog. Bushman and John began exchanging messages every few hours. Six weeks later, Bushman flew to Budapest to meet him. He expected to find a former senior employee of FIFA, or UEFA, which administers European soccer, who had gone rogue. But in a small hotel near the city's centre, he met Rui Pedro Gonçalves Pinto, a 27-year-old antique dealer with spiky hair from northern Portugal. It was around 5 p.m. and Pinto hadn't yet eaten breakfast. Real Madrid and A.S. Roma were playing that evening. Pinto took Bushman to a Serbian restaurant to watch the game and ordered a meat platter. They parted for two days. I was nearly to death, Bushman told me. Before the reporter left, Pinto gave him two hard drives containing 800 gigabytes of data. In the following three years, Pinto supplied Der Spiegel with four terabytes of confidential information, more than 88 million documents, a leak almost twice the size of the Panama Papers and 60 times that of Edward Snowden's. The information provided by Pinto has led to the conviction of dozens of top soccer players for tax evasion. It has prompted the Las Vegas Police Department to investigate an allegation of rape against Ronaldo. It has also revealed likely rule-breaking by Manchester City, the all-conquering champions of the English game, and a plan by Europe's leading teams to leave their national leagues and form their own competition. Since 2016, Der Spiegel has partnered with media organizations in 13 European countries to publish hundreds of stories, rewriting much of what was known about the soccer business and changing it in the process. The scale of football leaks, its totalizing nature, has brought about a novel anxiety among the sport's fixers and dealers. People are going to think at least twice before they do something which is not a hundred percent straight, a Portuguese agent told me. Last November, in response to Der Spiegel's stories about a breakaway league, fans in Germany mounted protests in stadiums across the country. But Pinto is a confounding figure. With a high school diploma and no formal IT training, he has managed to obtain and interpret information that European tax prosecutors and investigative journalists have sought for years. For me, he is a genius, Bushman told me. The question is, what is the other side of his personality? As soon as football leaks appeared, it had the air of an illicit enterprise. For a long time after Pinto was identified as the ringleader of the project, he denied his involvement and narrowly skirted arrest. In January, Pinto was detained in Hungary, on charges of cybercrime and extortion. While he waited to be extradited to Portugal, where he faces up to ten years in prison, I spent two days talking to him in his apartment in Budapest. Pinto is now thirty, but his fresh face and adolescent haircut give him the look of a student who has missed his last deadline. Each day, I arrived at around 1 p.m., when Pinto had just got out of the shower. Many of his answers had an artful, knowing quality. At tense moments, his face broke into a disarming smile. I really don't consider myself as a hacker, he told me. 
Pinto prefers to talk about what he has uncovered and to describe the evolution of European soccer from a varied and distinctive game to a corrupt playground for the international elite, in which only the richest, least scrupulous clubs can thrive. Pinto sees the future currently awaiting European soccer as bland and predictable. It will be like plastic, he said. Everything would be like a plastic thing. Pinto has studied the cases of celebrated leakers. His lawyer, William Bourdon, represented Snowden. And I often got the impression that he is trying to expand the definition of what a whistleblower can be. In 2016, Bushman asked Pinto where his information came from, and he replied, Some of our sources do not realize that they are our sources. One afternoon with me, Pinto mused out loud about why none of his insiders had gone public. He questioned whether Europe's whistleblowing protections were strong enough. I suggested that perhaps his sources hadn't gone public because they didn't exist, and that football leaks was the result of Pinto's hacking alone. That would be a plot twist, he said, flashing me his smile. The biggest plot twist ever. Pinto grew up in a small, blue-tiled house on a hill in Villanova de Gaia, which faces Porto, Portugal's second city, across the river Douro. On a dazzling morning in April, four of the eight newspapers on sale in town had stories about him on the front page. Pinto claims that he learned to read by listening to soccer commentators and matching the names that he heard against what was written on the players' shirts. At the age of four, he began to stay up late on Sundays to watch the highlights from the weekend's games, and to keep notebooks in which he would write down scores and players' statistics. My father once said that football will destroy my life, because I was kind of a fanatic, actually, he told me. Pinto's father, Francisco, designed dress shoes at a local factory. His mother, Maria, looked after him and his sister, who is ten years older. Francisco dabbled in antiquities, and when Pinto was seven, his father bought an Intel Pentium desktop computer with a dial-up internet connection, and installed it in the living room to buy and sell ancient coins online. eBay at that time was an extremely awesome opportunity, Pinto recalled. I learned everything sitting next to him. Pinto became fascinated by the Phoenicians, and by the Iberian and Celtic tribes that settled in Portugal before the Romans came. He watched the History Channel and dreamed of becoming an archaeologist. When Pinto was eleven, his mother was given a diagnosis of advanced lymphoma. He visited her in the hospital every day after school. After she died, he resolved to tell no one. I just pretended that nothing happened, and that is all, he said. He started skipping classes. He stayed up late, online. In school, Pinto was a quiet, distracted presence at the back of the class, who seemed to get his information from elsewhere. It's very, very difficult to characterize Rui, Mario Falcon, Pinto's high school geography teacher, told me. If he wanted it, he would probably be the best pupil from the class, but he was not. In 2004, when Pinto was 15, his team, FC Porto, won the Champions League, led by a brash, exacting coach named José Mourinho. Pinto was ecstatic. He came very happy to class, Falcon recalled but most of the time he was not there. Pinto's father often apologized for his son's poor attendance. What can a father do with a teenager who passes all the night with the computer, Falcon said. Pinto digitized the records of the school library. When I asked Falcon whether he agreed with Pinto's description of himself as a normal computer user, he said, no, and then repeated the word eight times. Pinto enrolled at the University of Porto, to study history in the fall of 2008. The following month, Banco Portugues de Negocios, a private bank, was nationalized amid allegations of fraud and money laundering, marking the start of the country's financial crisis. Pinto became part of what is known as Portugal's Gerasão Arrasca, Generation in Trouble. Unemployment among the young reached almost 40 percent. Hundreds of thousands of people emigrated. These younger people, twenty-five years or less, have to tell themselves this is not going to work, Felipe Carrera da Silva, a sociologist at the University of Lisbon who has studied the economic crisis, told me. In 2009, the shoe factory where Francisco had worked went bankrupt. He had taken early retirement to concentrate on antique dealing. In 2011, Portugal accepted a bailout from the International Monetary Fund. I mostly lost my motivation to do anything. 
Pinto said. More and more events started to appear and to show everyone how doomed was Portugal. In 2013, Pinto took part in a study abroad program in Budapest. I am not a rich person, so I could not go to a city like London or Paris, he told me. When he arrived at his student dorm in a complex of large Soviet-era apartment buildings in the east of the city, he experienced a sense of release. Budapest was fun. He loved the light on the Danube and the cobbled streets. Mixing with students from across Europe, Pinto gained a broader sense of the continent's economic crisis. He read about attempts by the German tax authorities to trace money that had been moved offshore. When he considered Spain, Italy, and Greece, where painful austerity measures had led to widespread street protests and the rise of populist parties, Pinto was struck by the passivity of his home country. If you look at the Portuguese people, most of the young people, they don't want to get involved in any of this, he said. They accept everything so easily. In the fall, Pinto returned to Villanova de Gaia. He was in the sixth year of a three-year history degree. He helped his father with the antique dealing, but not much else was happening. On September 18th, Pinto had 31 euros 67 cents in his checking account. The following day, he received a transfer of 34,627 euros from a client account at Caledonian Bank, a small private bank in the Cayman Islands. On Friday, October 11th, Pinto received a second windfall from Caledonian Bank, this time from an account belonging to NetJets, the private jet rental company, of €227,332.80. Two days later, he paid a cell phone bill of €15. Euros. The second transaction triggered an alert at the bank. The transfer was cancelled, and the money was returned to NetJets. According to a criminal complaint filed with Portuguese prosecutors the following week, someone had used a phishing attack to access Caledonian Bank's backup email servers. Equipped with usernames and passwords, the hacker had ordered the transfers to a Deutsche Bank account in Lisbon registered to Rui Pinto. The data from the first transaction were garbled, but the second transfer appeared to have been executed at 5.46am on October 10th from a computer science lab at the University of Porto. Pinto hired a lawyer, Aníbal Pinto, who works out of a glass-walled office on the outskirts of town. The two men are not related. When I asked Rui why he hacked into Caledonian Bank, he told me that he copied about a terabyte of data from the bank's servers, which he intended to hand over to European tax investigators. It was kind of interesting to find out what was going on, he said, but he never followed through. Pinto's account was frozen on November 6th. The police investigation was slow. The bank refused to name the victim of the first transaction, and the lab at the university did not keep computer use records for more than seven days. Pinto maintained that the second transfer was a banking error, and that the money from the first one belonged to him. During the summer of 2014, Anibal Pinto reached a deal with Caledonian Bank, in which his client agreed to return half the first transaction and keep the rest, a total of €17,313.50. Pinto was never charged with a crime. In February 2015, Pinto moved to Hungary for good. Portugal is a lovely country for a holiday, he told me. Just that. His father now traded in old posters, photographs, railway maps and flyers, mostly from the 19th century. Budapest was rich in ephemera from the Industrial Revolution and the early 20th century, which the Pintos sold for 10 or 20 euros per item online. In his first months in the city, Pinto went for interviews at a few call centres, where he could use his English and Portuguese. But he was increasingly distracted by soccer. That spring, Swiss police, acting on instructions from the FBI, arrested nine FIFA officials at a meeting in Zurich on corruption charges relating to the organization's decision to award the upcoming Soccer World Cups to Russia and Qatar. Pinto was also concerned about the fate of his hometown club. A week after FC Porto's victory in the Champions League in 2004, Mourinho had left to manage Chelsea, a London club that the previous year had been bought by the Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich. During the intervening decade, Porto had found it impossible to match the spending of the biggest clubs in Germany, Spain and England, or of trophy assets like Paris Saint-Germain, which had been acquired by the Emir of Qatar. 
Like other teams outside the gilded elite, Porto was taking ever greater financial risks in order to compete. When Pinto was back in Villanova de Gaia, he had travelled to a few away matches with the team's hardcore supporters club, the Super Dragons. At the games, he heard about a company named Doyen Sports Investments, backed by Kazakh money, which had been involved in several recent transfers. Something was not okay with football, Pinto said. The fact that I got such a confirmation coming from so close to Porto made me decide to act. During the summer, Pinto acquired thousands of internal emails and contracts from Doyen. He would not tell me how. What I can say about it is that it was surprising how confident these football entities are, he said. They think they are untouchable. One transaction that Pinto pieced together, a loan deal between FC Porto and Real Madrid for a young Brazilian midfielder named Casimiro, appeared to include a €700,000 fee for the son of Porto's club president. I felt like they were stealing my football club, Pinto told me, and that no one in Portugal even cared about it. Doyen, which had offices in London and Malta, was run by Nelio Lucas, a charismatic Portuguese agent in his late thirties. Between 2011 and 2015, Doyen invested around €300 million Euros in TPO deals. When football leaks went live that fall, Doyen was the common thread in many of the stories. On October 3rd, four days after Pinto posted the first documents, Lucas received an email in excellent Portuguese from someone calling himself Artem Lobozov. The name belongs to a Russian freestyle swimmer who competed in the 2012 Olympics. Lobozov threatened Lucas with more damaging disclosures. The leak is worse than you can imagine, he wrote. Lobozov said that journalists were desperate for him to share what he had. You certainly wouldn't want that, right? But we can talk. Lucas reported the email to the Portuguese police, who had already received a complaint about football leaks from Sporting Lisbon. In the following days, Lucas shared his conversation with Lobozov with detectives from the country's cybercrime unit. On October 5th, Lobozov said that a payment of between 500,000 and a million euros would be a good donation to make the material disappear. Lucas played along. Four days later, Lobozov emailed to say that his lawyer was waiting for Lucas to make contact. The lawyer's name was Anibal Pinto. A meeting was arranged for October 21st near Lisbon. Anibal Pinto flew south from Porto. A driver picked him up from the airport and took him to a roadside cafe on the A5 highway, around ten miles west of the city. Pinto was uneasy. Lawyers usually meet in their offices, he told me. The location had been chosen by the police. A surveillance van was stationed out of sight. Pinto was joined by a lawyer for Doyen and by Lucas, who was wearing a wire. Two plainclothes officers sat at a nearby table. The men discussed a possible contract between Doyen and Lobozov, worth 300,000 euros over five years. Conscious that the police were listening in, Lucas floated the idea of Lobozov coming to work for Doyen as an IT consultant. He asked Pinto about his client's hacking abilities. I immediately explained, this is a young Portuguese kid, Pinto recalled, not a major criminal organization. But Pinto described the Caledonian bank case. I already had something similar with him, Pinto explained. Toward the end of the meeting, when Doyen's lawyer was in the bathroom, Lucas offered Pinto a million euros to reveal his client's name. Pinto refused. Rui Pinto told me that he posed as Artem Lobozov to check that the documents he was posting were real. I wanted, basically, to see the reaction, he said. I know it was a naive attitude. In early November, Lobozov announced that he was walking away. Lucas and Doyen immediately came to suspect a different reason that Lobozov had broken off contact. The company hired a Portuguese security firm to study its servers. The investigation showed that Doyen's staff had been the victims of a phishing attack during the summer of 2015, in which they received replicas of Dropbox folders from contacts at various soccer clubs. On July 19th, Lucas had received a file named Players, supposedly from an official at FC Porto. When he attempted to open it, the file installed malware, which forwarded the contents of Doyen's London servers to a Russian email address. The hack raised the possibility that Lobozov was able to read Doyen's communications with the police in real time. Pinto told me that this was not the case. 
He read the messages only months later. The end of 2015 was a heady, disorienting time for Pinto. Fresh documents were pouring into football leaks from law firms, clubs, and agents. There were thousands of PDFs and emails which Pinto had no easy way of searching. He worked at night, combing through documents page by page. It was extremely hard for me at that time to realize the extent of the wrongdoings, he said. Pinto sought to post at least two contracts every day, but he was often disappointed by the media coverage, which reduced football leaks to a source of gossip about famous players. On January 20, 2016, Pinto published the transfer contract of Gareth Bale, a Welsh winger who had moved to Real Madrid from Tottenham Hotspur in the summer of 2013 for a little more than a hundred million euros. The contract was the 77th, published by Football Leaks. It showed that Madrid had announced a fictitious lower fee in order not to offend Madrid's star player Ronaldo, who was acquired for 94 million euros. It caused a kind of impact, Pinto said, but yeah, it's just nonsense. By the time Pinto met Bushman from Der Spiegel a few weeks later, he was considering abandoning the project. It was like messing up with my mind a bit he said. After the Lobozhov emails, Lucas had hired Markley Associates, a London-based private intelligence firm, to unmask football leaks. By mentioning the bank hack, Anibal Pinto had given the investigators a valuable clue. In March 2016, a website called Football Leaks Revealed briefly appeared, naming Rui Pinto as the source and publishing his photograph. The site was taken down, but Pinto was shaken. He finds Hungarian winters hard at the best of times. It's like an extra weight over my shoulders, he told me. That spring, Pinto decided to pause football leaks for six months to enable Der Spiegel to work through the data. But he would continue to look for secrets. There was something in him, Bushman told me. It was very powerful to bring him to this point and not to let him stop. Since 2011, Der Spiegel has occupied an austere tower in Hamburg, overlooking the city's former docks. The football leaks data are kept on the tenth floor, in an office labelled Geräterraum, or Equipment Room. On an overcast morning in March, I sat in the Geräterraum with Bushman, his editor, Michael Wurtzinger, and Nicola Naber, a researcher who have been the principal custodians of Pinto's data since the spring of 2016. They had tidied the office for my arrival, taking down diagrams and wall charts used to plot the latest wave of Football League's stories, which were published last November. Only a few pink post-it notes remained on the glass wall next to Naba's desk. Write, confront, write, confront. The first hard drives that Pinto gave to Bushman contained around 18 million files. Der Spiegel bought new servers and created a secure network to handle the data. We went shopping, Naba said. The magazine's IT team converted PDFs and emails into searchable text, while the reporters worked on Intella, specialized software used by prosecutors in fraud cases, to make connections within the documents. When I visited, the Intella home screen showed some 16 million emails, 85,000 presentations, 680,000 spreadsheets, and 105,000 contacts in the Football Leaks database. I typed in the name Jordan Pickford, the current goalkeeper for the English national team. There were 2,424 results. Mesut Ozil, an ethereal German playmaker for Arsenal, the team that I support, generated 8,629. An early story that the Spiegel team worked on was about Ronaldo's tax affairs. Ronaldo, a five-time winner of the Ballon d'Or for the world's best player, is a near-mythical figure in Portugal and Pinto's favourite player. In the spring of 2016, Pinto had discovered a company named Tolin in the British Virgin Islands, which Ronaldo might have been using to evade taxes that he owed in Spain. For weeks, Naba set about matching Ronaldo's global assets, $227 million in 2015, against his tax obligations and offshore income. It was all in the data. You sit here thinking, what would I need to know, Naba told me, and then you think, I would need to know the raw income in Ireland. You look it up, and it is there. It's crazy. Last June, after pleading guilty to tax fraud in Madrid, Ronaldo was given a two-year suspended jail sentence and fined almost 19 million euros. 
A few revelations leaped out. Bultzinger showed me the paperwork for the transfer of Paul Pogba, the midfielder for the World Cup-winning French national team who moved from Juventus to Manchester United for 105 million euros in the summer of 2016. The contracts promised 49 million euros to Pogba's agent, Mina Raiola, who represented all three sides in the deal. More often, however, the Spiegel team chased tantalizing hints in a sea of information. They came to see the sport in another way. One evening in 2017, Bushman was in a restaurant, watching Madrid's two major clubs compete for a place in the Champions League final. At one point, his mind drifted to the various funds and middlemen implicated in the match. When Bushman looked at the clock, twenty minutes had passed. I have often had the feeling in the last months and years that I can't watch the game like before, he told me. Pinto didn't have that problem. During the summer of 2016, the European Championship was held in France. Pinto followed the Portuguese team, captained by Ronaldo, obsessively. Most people, they don't know how to separate things, he told me. Outside of the pitch, I don't see Ronaldo the same way I see him inside the pitch. Against the odds, Portugal reached the final, playing France in Paris. Pinto watched the game in a pub in Budapest. Ronaldo left the field with a knee injury in the 25th minute. Portugal beat France in extra time, and Pinto burst into tears. The reporters in the Gareta-Rome sought to observe clear boundaries with Pinto. There was a risk of inciting him to hack. When I have a source where maybe five or ten or fifty percent he could be a hacker, it is totally impossible for us to ask him about documents, Bushman said. But there were times when they needed him. In the fall of 2016, Der Spiegel and its partners in European Investigative Collaborations, the reporting consortium that has worked on football leaks, were approaching the deadline for their first set of stories. But there was a glitch. Thousands of documents weren't showing up in the Intel software. Our IT team worked on this for weeks, Bushman said. One weekend, Pinto flew to Hamburg. During the afternoon, he insisted that Bushman take him to see Hamburger SV, the local Bundesliga team, play a match. He drank a few beers. For me, it was totally stressful, Bushman said. The stadium was full of cameras. In the evening, Bushman took Pinto to the Gretaram and showed him the problem. Pinto sat at a desk next to the window. It was the first time he had used Intella. Bushman left the room to make coffee. When I came back, he was ready, Bushman said. The problem was fixed. That December, Der Spiegel and the EIC published their first football leaks stories. The leading articles were about Ronaldo's finances, Doyen's aggressive TPO deals, and a network of Argentine agents who used shell companies and straw men in the Netherlands to evade taxes. The first stories went live at nine on a Friday night. In Budapest, Pinto was madly scrolling Twitter. He messaged Bushman. This is the most important day of my life. In early 2017, Pinto came across a file that was labelled Las Vegas. I was kind of curious about it, he said. Why Las Vegas? Let's see what's in here. The file contained emails between U.S. and Portuguese lawyers about an alleged incident that had taken place at the Palms Place Hotel in Las Vegas on the night of June 12, 2009. I got shocked. Pinto told me. It was a rape case. The documents included a settlement agreement signed on January 12, 2010 between a Ms. P and Mr. D, in which Ms. P was paid $375,000. A confidential side letter identified Ms. P as Catherine Mayorga, a former model who was then working at an elementary school, and Mr. D as Cristiano Ronaldo. Pinto alerted Bushman, who was at work on a book about football leaks with Wurtzinger and writing at home in Munster, a two-and-a-half-hour train ride from Hamburg. Clubs and companies implicated in the first wave of Spiegel's stories had mostly reacted with silence, or with fury that the information had come to light. In late December 2016, officials from Europe's top leagues had written to FIFA, saying that a breach of the transfer matching system— the global clearinghouse for soccer transfers, was the only plausible source of the leaks. More private investigators were hired to find out where the information was coming from. One evening, taking the subway in Hamburg, 
Bushman realized that he was standing on the wrong platform. As he ran to make his train, a wiry older man with a passing resemblance to Clint Eastwood switched platforms too. The doors closed before the man got on. A few days later, Bushman noticed the same man, in a heavy grey coat, entering a bookstore in Munster. I thought, okay, be cool. It is maybe something paranoid, he told me. It was only when the man sat near him in a restaurant in Berlin, three hundred miles east, that he was sure he was being followed. The rest of the Spiegel team believed that their emails and movements were being tracked too. They knew more than we would like, Wurtzinger said. When Bushman travelled to Las Vegas to investigate the rape allegation, he saw the man again, watching from a parked Volvo. The defensive response to Der Spiegel's stories made Pinto question the appetite of soccer's regulators to clean up the game. In interviews as John, he invited FIFA and UEFA officials to make contact with football leagues, but no one did. Pinto sees most soccer journalists as deferential to the sport's powerful broadcasters and sponsors. They don't want the people to see the truth, he told me. Pinto sometimes refers to real fans— who will demand a financial and moral overhaul of the sport as the intended audience for football leaks, but it is not clear whom he means by this or whether such a group exists. On April 14, 2017, Der Spiegel revealed the rape allegation against Ronaldo without naming Mayorga. The timing was propitious. Ronaldo, then at Real Madrid, was playing in a two-match Champions League quarter-final against Bayern Munich, the country's biggest club but the story gained little traction. Gesti Foot, a Portuguese soccer agency that represents Ronaldo and Mourinho, and whose president, Jorge Mendes, is one of the most powerful figures in the game, dismissed the article as a piece of journalistic fiction. Ronaldo scored two goals in the first game against Munich and a hat-trick in the second. Our story nearly was atomized, Wolzinger said. The public did not take notice of it. In Portugal, too, interest in football leaks had fallen away. After the initial stories about sporting Lisbon and FC Porto, the platform had focused mainly on the sport's larger leagues. But on a Tuesday afternoon that April, Francisco Marquez, the communications director for FC Porto, was leaving a restaurant near Porto Stadium when he received a message from an encrypted email platform called Tutanota. It appeared to include an internal media briefing document belonging to Benfica, FC Porto's arch-rival. Marquez asked the sender how he could be sure that it was real. I think the attached images will suffice, the source wrote, including screenshots of three Benfica officials' inboxes. One image had been taken in the previous half-hour. A few days later, Marquez received about twenty gigabytes of internal Benfica emails. The rivalry between Benfica and FC Porto contains multitudes. It is the South against the North, the capital against the rest, cosmopolitan glamour against honest toil. Between them, the clubs have won the Portuguese League 65 times. In a country of 10 million people, Benfica claims to have 6 million supporters, an assertion that gives rise to the idea that it is the most powerful institution in the country. Supporters of other clubs refer to Benfica as the octopus, and to the supposed shadowy nature of its influence in Portuguese society as Benfiquiston, or Benficaston. When I asked Marquez whether he considered returning the emails, he laughed. No, he said, this is war. Marquez has a show on Porto's TV channel, and in the weeks that followed he began to read the Benfica emails aloud on the air. He excluded personal gossip and salacious material and focused on evidence of Benfica's attempts to control the Portuguese game. In one instance, he shared secret briefings distributed to pro-Benfica commentators on Portuguese TV. In another, he read an email correspondence referring to the priests, a group of eight referees who could be relied on to favour Benfica at decisive moments, which ended, Now delete everything. There was a PowerPoint presentation from June 2012 in which Benfica officials mapped out a five-year plan to dominate the external environment and increase the club's power over Portugal's politicians, journalists, and justice system. Now it is public, Marquez said. It is not fair. The competition is not fair. In early June, Marquez handed Benfica emails to the police. 
He had wondered whether they were connected to football leaks in some way. The source described himself as a Porto fan, but a critic of the club's president. On the afternoon of July 12th, Marquez received a Tutanota email with four attachments, concerning a deal that Benfica had struck on land taxes around its stadium in Lisbon. Marquez never heard from the source again. On October 19th, the police raided Benfica's Estadio da Luz in northern Lisbon. Six weeks later, the leaks started again. This time the source simply posted the club's emails unedited on a blog titled O Mercado do Benfica, or The Benfica Market. There were many dirty things, Marquez told me. The emails contained medical records and conversations between club officials and their wives, along with player contracts, tactical reports, and the club's internal finances. A senior Benfica official compared the leaks to being under a terrorist attack. We don't know when it comes, the next one, where it comes from, or what sort of missile it is, he said. We don't know anything. The police raided the club's offices twice in the early months of 2018. That March, the head of Benfica's legal department, Paulo Gonçalves, was arrested on suspicion of bribing three judicial officials to provide him with updates on the case. The Benfica scandal, the biggest in Portuguese soccer in recent decades, has driven the enmity between the clubs to new heights. Benfica is currently suing FC Porto, seeking 17 million euros in damages. When Marquez dropped me off at my hotel in Porto, he showed me his phone, which each day is deluged with messages from Benfica fans promising to kill him. It changed my life, he said, not entirely unhappily. Now I can't go to the south. Spurred by the Benfica leaks, prosecutors looked at other recent sports-related crimes in Portugal. These included the Doyen extortion case against Artem Lobuzov, which had been dormant for more than two years. A handwritten note in a Portuguese police file, dated April 27, 2018, said that the Doyen complaint had been investigated alongside the alleged hacking of Sporting Lisbon in the early days of football leaks in the fall of 2015. A suspect has been identified, the note read. Rui Pinto. At the time, De Spiegel and the EIC were preparing their second wave of football leaks articles. At the beginning of 2018, Pinto had given Bushman more hard drives, which brought the number of documents in the Intella database to more than 70 million. The team in the Greta Rome decided to pursue two stories that had eluded European soccer journalists for years. The first was about how the most profligate clubs, namely the cutter-backed Paris Saint-Germain and Manchester City, which is owned by Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed El Nayyan, a member of Abu Dhabi's royal family, had been able to defy the sport's spending rules. Since 2013, under a set of regulations known as financial fair play, European clubs have had to balance their expenditures against their income from soccer-related sources in order to take part in UEFA competitions. But for years, the teams with the wealthiest owners seemed to benefit from suspiciously generous sponsorship and marketing deals, which helped to keep their finances in line. The Football League's data showed that, in the summer of 2012, PSG signed a five-page sponsorship contract with the Qatar Tourism Authority for more than a billion euros. A UEFA investigation later calculated its true market value to be around 15 million. Internal emails from Manchester City suggested that club officials were massaging deals and supplementing them with funds from Sheikh Mansour's holding company, Abu Dhabi United Group. In the spring of 2013, Manchester City's chief financial officer, Jorge Chumias, emailed one of the club's directors, Simon Pierce, to check that it was OK to alter a series of contracts in order to comply with UEFA's rules. Of course, Pierce replied, we can do what we want. Manchester City denies all allegations that have originated from the football leaks data, saying, the attempt to damage the club's reputation is organised and clear. Der Spiegel also pursued a story about a long-rumoured plan for Europe's biggest clubs to leave their national leagues and form a closed NFL-style competition covering the continent. The idea of a soccer Super League has been around since the late 1980s. It is the logical commercial end point for a sport in which a handful of teams currently dominate their domestic markets, but in many countries it would break more than a century of sporting tradition. By searching the emails of senior officials at Europe's leading clubs, the reporters at Der Spiegel 
discovered detailed discussions about the formation of a Super League in early 2016. That February, Bayern Munich, the most successful team in the history of German soccer, explored the legal implications of withdrawing from the Bundesliga. In the following months, executives from seven powerful clubs, including Barcelona, Juventus, Manchester United and AC Milan, met twice to discuss potential formats for the breakaway league. One presentation was called A Super League Scenario for Top European Football. A club director involved in the discussions told me that the plan was a negotiating ploy. It was no secret, he said, but he didn't make the idea sound entirely abstract either. When I asked whether a Super League in European soccer was inevitable one day, the director replied, In a certain form, yes. He weighed the pros and the cons of the format. You have to be careful, he conceded. There is the fact you are killing the rest of football in Europe. In the summer of 2018, the rape allegation against Ronaldo gained fresh impetus. Encouraged by the widespread reporting of sexual misconduct by powerful men and the use of non-disclosure agreements to silence victims, Mayorga hired a new lawyer, Les Stovall, who wrote to Pinto through an anonymous email address asking if he had any other documents. Pinto unearthed multiple versions of a 27-page transcript of an apparent interview of Ronaldo, identified as X, conducted by a member of his legal team, Paolo Rendero, about the alleged attack. Answers in the earliest version of the document appeared to corroborate Mayorga's account. X. She said that she didn't want to, but she made herself available. The whole time it was rough. I turned her onto her side, and it was fast. Maybe she got some bruises when I grabbed her. She didn't want to give it to me. Instead, she jerked me off. I don't know any more exactly what she said when she was jerking me off, but she kept saying no. Don't do it. I'm not like the others. I apologized afterward. In the transcript, Mayorga was identified as Ms. C. Question. Did Ms. C ever raise her voice, scream, or yell? X. She said no and stopped several times. Pinto sent the transcript to Stovall, who forwarded it, with other information from football leaks, to Las Vegas police on August 25th last year. In September, in an interview with Der Spiegel, Mayorga accused Ronaldo of raping her and the Las Vegas police opened an investigation. Ronaldo has protested his innocence throughout. In an Instagram video posted two days after the story appeared, he described the reporting as fake news. It's normal, Ronaldo said. They want to be famous to say my name, but it's part of the job. I'm happy man and all good. On September 13th last year, two weeks before Mayorga's interview appeared, Sabadu, a Portuguese magazine, named Pinto as the source behind football leaks and the prime suspect in the release of the Benfica emails. Pinto's face was on the cover. The Portuguese media harried him, and his Facebook page rapidly filled with threats from Benfica fans. Pinto had worried about being publicly identified and about how best to defend himself for some time. In 2017, prosecutors from France's Parque National Financier an anti-corruption unit had made contact with football leaks, inviting John to share his data. France has some of the strongest whistleblowing protections in Europe. The following summer, Pinto approached William Bourdon, who specialises in whistleblower cases, and asked him to broker a meeting. In late November, Pinto travelled to Paris to meet with the PNF. I spoke as a witness, he recalled, basically said what kind of data I have, how I got the data, and that is all. Pinto told me that he also met with officers from France's witness protection program who gave him a secure phone with which to contact them in case of an emergency. They considered that my situation was quite alarming, he said. After he returned to Budapest, Pinto resolved to move to France in February. All this situation was a bit stressful, he told me. Pinto confided in Bushman. He said often to me, I will have a family, I will have kids, Bushman said. I will have a normal life. In the middle of January 2019, Pinto's father and his stepmother, Elizabeth, visited him. They suspected that something was going on, Pinto said. When they arrived at Pinto's apartment on a quiet residential street in Budapest's 7th district, they couldn't open their luggage. Their suitcases had combination locks, which seemed to have been tampered with. The following evening, Pinto and his father went to the supermarket. When they returned to Pinto's street, there were police cars and men in uniform. 
I realized, okay, they're coming for me, he said. Upstairs, the police seized Pinto's laptop, three cell phones, including the one belonging to the French authorities, three USB sticks, and fourteen hard drives, containing twenty-nine terabytes of data. Pinto was taken to a detention center, where he asked to call his lawyer. The police said no. They said, this is not an American movie, Pinto recalled. Pinto was released under house arrest. When I visited him in late February, he wore a Levi's T-shirt, jeans, and an electronic tag on his left ankle. His parents had stayed in Hungary, but his apartment felt spare, as if he had recently moved in. There was a double bed in the living room, where his parents slept, a table with a brown synthetic tablecloth, and some small, gaudy landscapes on the walls. The police had taken his DVR. Pinto was spending most of his time thinking about his case. According to the arrest warrant issued by the Portuguese authorities, he was being held on six charges, relating to the alleged blackmailing of Doyen and the hacking of sporting Lisbon contracts in the fall of 2015. The warrant made no mention of the Benfica emails and the subsequent embarrassment for Portugal's biggest soccer club, which Pinto was convinced were the real reasons for his arrest. Politicians, prosecutors, even police detectives, they lose their focus when it comes to football, he said. When I asked Pinto if he had anything to do with the Benfica scandal, he denied it, in Pinto-esque fashion. I've never seen a statement from the police or the Portuguese authorities linking me to this. He worried that his gargantuan data set, of which Der Spiegel possesses only around 14%, might be lost or destroyed if it were handed over to the Portuguese police. He was also afraid of being attacked by Benfica's most notorious supporters, a group called the No Name Boys. I asked Pinto if he was aware of the irony of being killed by soccer fans. Yeah, he replied, I'm aware of that. The following week, Pinto had an extradition hearing at Budapest's central courthouse. I arrived early, with Bushman. The corridor outside the courtroom filled with news crews and lawyers. Bourdon was there, wearing a long green overcoat. Pinto is five feet six inches tall. When he appeared, led by two thick-set Hungarian police officers, he looked like a student on a Eurail trip gone wrong. He is a cat, Bourdon murmured, a poor, fragile cat. Extraditions between EU member states are almost always routine affairs. When the judge ordered that Pinto and his data be handed over to the Portuguese authorities, Bourdon slapped his rollerboard suitcase in frustration. After the hearing, Pinto sat on a bench in the corridor in handcuffs and gave an impromptu news conference to some Portuguese journalists. I did this for the public, he said. I did this for all football fans. The journalists wanted more, but Pinto seemed to dry up. What else can I say? he added. I have to go to a Hungarian prison. Pinto was extradited to Lisbon on March 21st. Three days before he was handed over to the Portuguese police, Belgian prosecutors came to Budapest and copied all his data. Pinto's hard drives, which are heavily encrypted, are what he hopes will eventually secure his freedom. It is one thing to copy them. It is another thing to have access to them, a member of his legal team told me. In February, Prosecutors from Eurojust, the EU's Judicial Cooperation Unit, met in Brussels to discuss how to analyse the Football League's data in a systematic way. Jean-Yves Lorgoglio of the PNF described Pinto as a whistleblower and confirmed that the French authorities had looked at 12 million documents so far. The following month, UEFA announced that, as a result of the Spiegel coverage, it was investigating Manchester City, the newly crowned English Premier League champions, for breaking its financial rules. The club faces a potential ban from the Champions League. You don't have to convince me that Pinto is at risk of one day being convicted as a hacker and for stealing information. It's true there is a risk. But Snowden did the same, Bourdon told me. There is a principle of proportionality, of the violation of the law compared to the services rendered. Pinto came from nowhere, and he opened the eyes of millions and millions of citizens. In Portugal, Pinto's return was front-page news. When I was in Lisbon last month, an impersonator was playing him on Portuguese late-night TV. The name of the character was Rui Pinto the Hacker. In the last months of the Benfica market, which has gone quiet since Pinto's arrest, the blog took on a broader, anarchic quality, 
posting emails from one of Portugal's largest law firms and also secret judicial documents. Although Pinto denies any involvement, he is widely seen as a figure of general, youthful rebellion in a country where other forms of activism have been absent. Rui is literally one in a million, Carrera da Silva, the sociologist, told me. He is also a hero to everyone who hates Benfica. During my conversation with Marquez, FC Porto's communications director, we discussed the greatest recent figures in Portuguese soccer. Mendes, the agent, Mourinho, Ronaldo. Now we have four, Marquez said. Football after Rui Pinto is better. While Pinto awaits his trial, he's being held at a prison next to police headquarters in central Lisbon. Francisco Teixeira da Mota, Pinto's Portuguese lawyer, told me that he expected prosecutors to try to add the theft of Benfica's emails to the case. That is a risk that can happen at any moment, he said. Pinto is being kept away from the other prisoners for his own protection, but when he is allowed to exercise or to venture outside his cell, he sometimes hears them yell his name, in what he takes to be encouragement. To pass the time, he has been reading a book about espionage during the Second World War. I once asked Pinto whether he was an idealist, and he surprised me by seeming not to know the word. We were in his apartment in Budapest. He opened a laptop and looked it up. A person who is guided more by ideals than by practical considerations, Pinto read from the screen. Utopian, visionary, wishful thinker, fantasist, fantasizer, romantic, romanticist, dreamer. It was enough. Maybe this word applies to me. Maybe, yes. If you enjoyed this production, find the best long-form articles read aloud in the Autumn app, available now for iPhone. Autumn presents A Reporter at Large, published in the print issue of the New 